I'm Professor Susan Watkins, Director of the Centre for Culture and the Arts at Leeds Beckett University. Welcome to December's Leeds Cultural Conversation, organised in partnership with Leeds City Council and the publisher Pablo Mendes. For more information about forthcoming talks in the series, please visit our website. Today I'd like to introduce James McGrath, who is a Senior Lecturer in Cultural Studies in the School of Cultural Studies and Humanities at Leeds Beckett. His specialist areas are poetry, popular music, particularly the Beatles and the 1960s. In addition to this, for the last 10 years, James has been researching the crossing of cultural studies into disability theory and medical humanities, frequently concerning autism. James is also a widely published poet. His publications on the Beatles emphasise the influences of working class and Afro-Caribbean culture on the band. And definitely that's something that we maybe should get him to give another talk on next year. He's been interviewed widely about that research and was a research consultant for two films about John Lennon, Nowhere Boy and Lennon Naked. He's currently working on an interdisciplinary project about autism and Asperger's syndrome, which involves promoting greater interaction between the humanities and the sciences as well as exploring the portrayal of autism in fiction, science, poetry and film. This will be published as a book to be titled The Naming of Adult Autism. And it's that research that he's sharing with you today to coincide with disability history months. The title of his talk is Autism, Adulthood and Fictions, Reading Autism Portrayals After Diagnosis. So let's welcome James. Hello. Um, first of all, uh, thank, thank you for coming uh, on Wednesday lunchtime. I know lunchtime isn't always easy for people to uh, to make time for things. Um, thank you most of all to this man, Matthew Cagle, uh, who, um, if you've been to these events before, you will probably have seen him. Uh, the late Matthew Cagle. It's very painful to think of him that way. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to Matthew because now seemed like the perfect time for me because I know he would have been here. He supported his students, staff, colleagues in everything we chose to do. Whether he agreed with it or not, he supported us. So I want to talk about uh, autism and uh, adulthood. Um, in some ways, in many ways, uh, eight decades on from when autism was first defined in the 1940s, eight decades on, knowledge and understanding of this condition are still very much in their infancy. And it's kind of apt, but not necessarily good. It's kind of apt, but not good that uh, the dominant symbol of autism in culture tends to be the child. There's very little recognition that while children, autistic children will always be autistic, uh, they will not always be children. And uh, that's not to say that this way of being doesn't involve all sorts of growing as, uh, as a person. As Stuart Murray pointed out, it is not a static state. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, there should be more depiction of uh, autistic adults and less of autistic children. I'm saying there should be more recognition of autistic adults alongside all other adults. So there's no biological test to diagnose autism. No scan or blood test or anything like that. It's all done, as you probably know, by narrative, uh, by language. So therefore, uh, my subject area, mostly in literature studies, um, that, that, that's one of the, uh, one of the sort of links, really. Uh, autism is uh, diagnosed according to language, according to how people narrate uh, you from outside. Uh, as well as how a person presents her or himself. Uh, so language is mostly what I deal with. Uh, so um, how, how is autism uh, 
conceptualized. Um, that, that, that's quite a typical image uh, of autism, a white male child. This is uh, the Cambridge University Autism uh, Research Centre. Um, I think that place is quite problematic. I mean, okay, so there's this quite uh, familiar, if slightly cliched image of uh, the male child uh, playing with Lego. And I think, uh, to use Lego as a metaphor, the Cambridge Autism Research Centre, led by Professor Simon Baron Cohen, that research centre is like uh, one piece of Lego. What they do is a bit like trying to construct an understanding of autism with only one piece of Lego. What I mean by that is it is very, very, very male dominated. And uh, they have a particular emphasis on autism and STEM subjects. STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, one of the core definitions used by the Cambridge uh, ARC is that um, autism can be fundamentally characterised by a deficiency in empathy. They define empathy, uh, reasonably enough, as a, a drive to understand people. That Research Centre also emphasises that people with autism, supposedly all people with autism, have um, an exceptional flair for systemising, which they define as the drive to understand systems. And they use the examples of uh, science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, Baron Cohen insists that systemising belongs to men. It's basically a male trait. I don't agree with this. Um, and that empathising is basically a female trait. Um, and if you're wondering, no, he wasn't writing in the 19th century, he is writing now. Uh, and um, so Baron Cohen says systemising, empathising are wholly different processes. Uh, I, I really seriously doubt that. I seriously doubt that. One of the big problems here, one of the big ironies, is that, okay, if systemising understanding systems and empathising, understanding people, are wholly different. What are we to make of the fact that the way autism is tested is a whole series of systems? Questionnaires, for example, those are screening tools that, you know, autism is, isn't diagnosed via questionnaires, but preliminary screening tools sent out to people um, which may decide whether they get referred for assessment or not. Th those can be decisive at, um, at that point. And one of uh, se several of the questions on the main questionnaire are scored in such a way that uh, if you answer the statement, uh, I enjoy reading fiction, that, that is classed as uh, a score point for uh, neurotypicality, as in non-autism. Uh, if you answer questions about whether or not you enjoy mathematics, that, that's always counted as a, an autistic trait. Um, th there are all sorts of problems with this. I don't feel necessarily that um, Baron Cohen is necessarily wrong in his hypothesis that yes, there might be links between autism and maths, but it's the one piece of Lego thing again. He, th th they're not the dominant researchers in this country are not particularly interested in the depths of uh, diversity in autistic people. Uh, so, for me, uh, as, um, as someone who uh, kind of was first advised when I, when I was 20, um, you should find out about Asperger's syndrome, and I, I, just, I just didn't, but then it became kind of inescapable. Uh, things like, um, one reason why uh, the, the, the awareness of that became inescapable was because of fiction, actually. Things like a curious incident of the dog in the night time. Um, and and uh, around, around that time, um, well, something that's heavily informed my research, at first I tried to sort of suppress it in my consciousness, but then I thought I'll, I'll just 
go with this. But the, the 10 years I spent between the ages of 15 and 25 uh, working in jobs in which I seriously, seriously struggled. Uh, that was before I um, became a, a PhD student. Um, and uh, what one thing that would start to happen to was people would say, uh, do you know what, I've read that book, Curious Instance of the Dog, you don't half remind me of him. Um, in, in this setting, I won't, I won't repeat what I said uh, back to that. But another uh, kind of uh, preconception is that people with autism or autistic people uh, are somehow genetically predisposed to not understanding uh, metaphor. Uh, now, again, there's so much that could be said about this, but uh, a scholar of uh, rhetoric, including metaphor itself, uh, Elizabeth Ashton, writes of how uh, metaphor is often used when we simply don't have an explanation for something. And uh, metaphors surround the very notion of autism. If, um, so, so the word autism comes from autos, which is Greek uh, for self. And I, I'm, I'm not denying that, that it, it has its value, that word. But uh, autism, autos, it's like the only element in, in that word. And it suggests that existence is, is, is somehow restricted to the, to, to the self. And, and that, that, that's really unfortunate because what about sensory issues, which is something that really a lot of autistic people seriously struggle with. Uh, I, mean, I mean, the reason, the main reason why I, uh, un unless, unless I'm going to a funeral or something, I don't, I don't wear a shirt. Uh, I prefer t-shirts, and that's just a sensory issue. Uh, when I was, um, I, think, I think this is, uh, I suspect this might be difficult for a lot of children, because when I was uh, at school, and I complained that I hated my school uniform, I think people just thought I was being sort of fussy, but then the doctor <coughs> actually, because I kept on getting all this eczema and things. So I was eventually allowed to wear uh, a sweater made of a different um, material. But this thing, to be autistic is, is not to be totally self-enclosed at all. It, it's to be, you know, open, potentially vulnerable to all sorts of outside um, influences. So, what, one of the recent metaphors around autism is uh, so-called um, broken mirror theory. Um, this refers to, to, to a theory, or perhaps a metaphor, of uh, the mirror neuron system. Uh, th this was m most of the research on this has actually been done um, not on people, but on monkeys. Um, so the idea of a mirror ne neuron system is that uh, we, we automatically reciprocate if... Um, Okay, so something that is often associated with autism and may affect a diagnosis or, 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 or a non-diagnosis is reciprocation. And uh, so when we look in a mirror, you move your arm, the image reciprocates. Um, and the theory is that what, whatever is causing autism, if ever that could be defined, is to do with this process, wherever in the brain it might be located. There are lots and lots of critics of that theory. Um, but I think it's quite telling to just look at some of the language that's been used, this thing of imitation. Um, mir mirrors come up a lot in, in uh, imagery to do with autism. And uh, I'd like to think that, uh, I think it's quite important to think of sort of holding the mirror back up to the people who are diagnosing you and things. Um, reflecting back what is being projected. Um, because the way that autism is conceptualised tells us quite a lot about dominant social values. Um, so this thing of uh, not reciprocating, there's a thing to do with obedience there. You've got to, you've got to behave in a, in a certain way because, and if you don't, well, we, we have got uh, an aim for you. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that autism is simply definitely not simply uh, a label. 
Um, but where language is concerned, these things are sometimes important to look at. Another thing about the language, I don't know if you can see the, the writing below, but um, so, so the idea of a disorder. Um, neurodiversity movements are very much promoting the idea that autism is about diversity neurologically rather than, um, rather than something more negative. And I think that that has, uh, that has its value, but it's, it, it, it is very complicated. I mean, people are diagnosed when um, a certain number of autistic traits are, are sort of uh, perceived by people who make the diagnosis, and they are deemed to uh, be causing a person suffering in, uh, in daily life. Um, obviously, that, again, is really subjective. How, how, how do we know if someone's suffering? Something like class is really potentially important here. So, for example, if someone um, is, uh, suppose, supposing you're a, a potter, uh, you're an autistic ceramic artist and you're, you're making a living uh, making pottery ornaments and you get by and that, that's good, then there's recession and people can't afford to buy these things anymore. So you end up getting a job in a coal centre or something. That, that can totally uh, tilt or revolve the whole notion of what, what, what is meant uh, by, by suffering. Um, something that I've been thinking about with regard to fiction is combined with this idea that um, to be autistic is to somehow be automatically indifferent to or confused by uh, fiction. It, it, it's, it's therefore a bit unsettling to think about how, how often autism is actually portrayed in fiction. And uh, on, on this particular topic of autism, I, I, I'm cautious, very cautious of using the word uh, representation because uh, it has been pointed out that fiction about autism by non-autistic people tends to be much, much more popular than any books written by autistic people. Um, so representation, I, I think there's a need to be cautious of that when we're talking about autism. Um, I've been thinking about something that the best way I could make sense of this to myself was to think of um, the pastoral uh, tradition. So in, um, th th this is gonna seem like a total uh, divergence as most things I say tend to, but I'll, I'll get to why in a minute. But this thing of pastoral art, one kind of critical interpretation of that tradition in art is that um, for the wealthy landowners, um, they could have paintings like this on the walls of their mansion to remind themselves that they were doing the rest of the world a big favour. So, so the point is that labourers are usually made to look quite contented. Look, aren't they in a lovely surrounding? Isn't the weather good? The, you know, he, he doesn't look like he's on the brink of starving, does he? So it's a tradition in art that kind of comforts uh, those in power. There's, uh, there's another example here. Um, so again, it's, uh, it's good weather, that, you know, that, that they look quite healthy. They don't look like they're struggling. This thing of this kind of art to reassure the ruling classes that those who are less privileged are basically having a really good time. Um, I somehow keep thinking of this with uh, certain recent uh, portrayals of autism. Um, so, uh, Big Bang Theory, people, people often ask me um, if, I, if I like it. Uh, I, I know plenty of people um, with autism who, who, who really like that show. Personally, I can't stand it. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lindsay. Um, I mean, it, we, we get... Uh, there, for me, there are just too many clichés in here. I know it's not... I know that it does have its kind of sensitive moments. Um, I, I haven't noticed them, but I am assured that it does have its subtle moments. Um, but it's this, this big tradition in, in autism, uh, autism fiction, where there will always be one character who is singled out. And very often, that is the only autistic person in the narrative. In this, you know, it's kind of uh, 
there's a bit more sort of variety, but of course it, it all lands on that um, that character of, uh, of Sheldon. And, and the, the way this reminds me of the pastoral tradition, it's just because um, in depictions of adult autism, so often people are sort of comfortably, successfully employed. That is not necessarily, that is not a realistic uh, idea of how most autistic adults uh, experience life. Um, there's another one here, uh, The Rosie Project. Um, this is a sort of romantic comedy novel uh, by an Australian author, Graeme Simpson. Um, th this has something in common with Big Bang Theory. Uh, well, well it's, again, it's a white male scientist, um, a professor, the publisher's blurb, which you see on the back of the book, you see it on the publisher's website, uh, Don is a man who may just be on the autism spectrum. And, uh, you know, from the, the back page of the novel, every page within the novel, you get pretty much every cliche you can think of to do with autism. And again, it does have its good moments, but when you get things like that, and Big Bang Theory, um, Rain Man with the maths thing, uh, Curious Instant of the Dog, um, maths, you know, he gets an A-level grade A in maths at the age of 15. Um, all of these things do have some value, but together they tend to gang up and create this kind of stereotype. Uh, after being told by, um, by one therapist, I mean, I do, I do have the, the, the formal diagnosis, in, in, um, but, but um, along the way to that, being told by one therapist, I, I really think you would find it possibly quite transformative to your life to go for a, an actual assessment. But another one said, well, you, you study English, because I was a student at the time, um, you don't work in IT, forget it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so some professionals, uh, yeah, some professionals. <laughs> so, I'm just going to check the time. So, something else that keeps coming up in, in this kind of narrative, hi, thanks for coming, is um, the word autism will be mentioned in what tends to be called the paratext. So that's things like the blurb on the back of a book, um, the, uh, the promotion of a, a film. It will be mentioned there, but it's never mentioned in the script. Um, that, that's something common to Big Bang Theory and the Rosie project, The Bridge, another TV series. It's also a pattern with Curious Incident of the Dog. It's on the back cover, Christopher has Asperger's Syndrome, this is what Asperger's Syndrome is. But no one ever mentions it within the text. And in some ways, it's a kind of futuristic thing of autism not needing a label, not needing to be named. There are ways of looking at that positively, but I don't think we're at that point yet at all, because what to me that pattern smacks of is um, it's as if it's something that we shouldn't talk about. The these fictional characters are not given the agency, the power to express how it feels to have this diagnosis. The diagnostic procedures are never very, they're very, very, very rarely depicted in any fictional narratives. So when you get things like, um, oh, this TV series features uh, an adult with Asperger's syndrome, and it's just sort of said like that, like with the bridge, with, uh, with those things I just showed, it's understandable that some people think it's just some kind of fashionable label or something. Uh, now, the examples I've just talked about are not the only examples, but they are some of the most popular. And I want to kind of promote um, that, that's just part of the other tendency, the, the so-called geek syndrome. All, all people with autism are successful computer programmers uh, who have uh, comfortable jobs and win Nobel Prizes. It's a good book in lots of ways, but that thread is running through it, and it's a, a fat <laughs> thread. Um, but this book by Claire Morale from 2008, uh, The Language of Others, uh, this is one of my favourite novels of, of any kind, but in particular, <laughs> for how it uh, deals with autism. Can I just ask, has anyone 
read that novel. Okay, I, I, I nearly missed it. Um, but the thing is, it just didn't get the kind of cultural attention given to these, these other things. I can't help but thinking, uh, well, the things that do get the big commercial success tend to rely and reinforce rely on and reinforce stereotypes. This challenges them. Um, so Professor Susan Watkins at the uh, inaugural talk um, mentioned about the Booker Prize and he gave a list of uh, how many um, Booker Prize winners are female novelists, very few, and those who are, uh, how many female novelists writing about women characters fewer still and, and I think that like so much in dominant power structures kind of filters down into cultures uh, of autism. Um, this uh, is a quote from what, one of the main critics, um, one of the main writers on autism and fiction is uh, Ian Hacking. He is very, very dismissive of Morale's novel. Um, the, so he writes, uh, we're all kept in the brightly illumined dark desperately waiting for the heroine finally to realise what is wrong with her. So it's made obvious to the reader on, on the first page. Then at the end she has a kind of epiphany. Um, what, what, what Hacking dislikes about that novel is actually what I think, uh, is, is what I value on it. Because when this character Jessica Fontaine uh, realises that this is the situation, it, it, it really transforms the way she sees her own past. And, and that, that is something that I think certainly I uh, ex experienced that very, very intensely when I started getting told about autism, and especially so during the diagnostic process, because you're asked so much and other people are asked so much um, about their childhood. But um, one reason why I would recommend Claire Morrell's novel is uh, quite often you get a character, an autistic character in a fictional narrative, and, and it's as if that's all they are. Whereas Morale, her novel is about being an undiagnosed woman with, autis with autism, o also about being, um, being married, being divorced, being a single parent. So again, class is, is, is an important aspect of this novel. The intersectionality within it is, uh, is, I, think, um, is I think, very valuable. Um, just, just one more that I'd like to mention before I finish. Um, Douglas Copeland, uh, Microsurfs from 1995, and in particular, J-Pod from 2006. Um, Copeland, Canadian novelist and artist and uh, prose writer. Um, he, he writes about autism in different scenarios quite, quite a lot. Um, the, the, that, uh, and it is talked about, it is debated. Not, you know, it's only kind of briefly in those novels, but it is there and it's done in an important way. And Copeland himself identifies as having Asperger's syndrome. Um, when you read an interview with him, that information will be there, but he's not quoted on it. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what the situation is, is there, but he... He writes about it in, in fascinating ways. And I think it's important for me to distinguish here between what Copeland is saying about adult autism and what his characters are, are saying. Um, I mean, what one thing when someone's kind of explaining it to someone who's not, not sure what to make of it, she says, well, uh, I, I definitely think our colleague is autistic because he, he, he doesn't like being touched by other people. And th this, I, c I can own, obviously, I can only speak from my experience, just, just like any other person, whatever your identity. We can only refer to our own experience, but it is important to try and empathise as well. And so it's often been observed of me. Sometimes friends will be a bit sort of upset by it, as if some sort of gesture towards me, I would sort of flinch, I wouldn't be able to, to um, control it. And that is not necessarily, to me, that is not necessarily to do, to do with being touched by another person. It's something to do with the skin nerves or something like that. I flinch in the same way if I'm walking through a wood or something and, and just the side of me 
suddenly jump or something, rushes on something, I flinch in the same way. It is not, so what I'm saying is for me, that is not just a response to other human beings. It is not in any way a rejection of other human beings. It, it's something more complicated than that. Um, and again, the, uh, I, I, and I really have to emphasize that, um, that I, I might just be completely unusual in this regard, but um, Copeland writes about a character who is described by others as having elective mutism. So uh, goes for long periods uh, without speaking. Um, most of the characters I've been talking about, uh, or all of them in fact, are verbal people. They're also pre-verbal autistic people, um, people who, who don't, uh, don't speak in, in, in the conventional understanding of, of the term. But this thing about elective mutism, I, I don't know, I just think, I, I can remember lots of times when people have said to me, James, you, you're so quiet today, what, what's wrong? And, and there's nothing wrong. Uh, I can remember my grand saying it to me when I was a child, why do you keep going quiet? What, what, what's, what's worrying you? But I, I was all right. I was thinking, I was busy, busy thinking. Um, another kind of uh, non-autistic stereotype of autistic people is that they, uh, they bombard you with uh, information. Um, uh, as I've just done. Um, <laughs> To me, though, uh, that is uh, that. If, 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 some, if you feel like someone's bombarding you with information, um, it might just be that they're, they're trying to share something with you, maybe in a, an unconventional uh, way. But you know, when you get these characters in fiction who start reciting lots and lots of facts, and you're supposed to respond, "God, what a boring character," but. Um, to me, that, that's an attempt to share something. And it's not about pushing people away. It's not about saying, this is what I think, this is what I think, this is what I think, and it's important. It, it, it's trying to make a connection with people. OK, so uh, what time is it? We've got, uh, we've got till half past. It's now seven minutes past. Would anyone like to ask a question or, or say anything? We don't, we don't have to take till half past, but <laughs> Heather. talking about in terms of how people have this particular sort of stereotype based on yeah. a very narrow interpretation of autism. Um, and is there a connection here or generally to other representations of people, you know, slightly othered in society? So I'm thinking particularly of some representations yeah. of mental health. Yes. And the one I'm thinking of particularly, which I struggle with, um, not because, you know, because I have some sort of family experience of this, is the representation of bipolar or manic depression, right. which often, particularly for someone like Stephen Fry, is, 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 seems to fall into this idea of this thing where you, you know, it's, it's a terrible disease, but you're creative and sort of actually it gives you yeah. sort of imaginary create, and which seems so far from the experience, the damaging experience of what mental health can be. And it's amazing, it seems like how powerfully that stereotype has sort of taken hold, partly because of the sort of celebrity endorsement. Yeah. And this is partly it just because you get one or two portrayals like this. You can think of Rain Man particularly, but also the, um, the part of the author of The Dog at Midnight. Uh, Mark, Mark Adden, yeah. Those just become so predominant, they just absolutely sort of, you know, they seem to sort of then generate yeah, yeah, yeah. When something popular, it, yeah, it will get imitated, won't it? And because it's kind of already familiar, it's quite easy. For, it's seen as quite easy for people to take in. It's like I, um, I don't know. There seems to be low expectations of the audience there because I think most people are way more broad-minded than uh, the most big publishing companies give them credit for. Um, but yeah, kind of glamorization uh, of mental health. And mental illness. I, 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 yeah, I agree with you, and I think the, the Stephen Fry example. Yeah, glamorisation doesn't sound quite the right word. Okay. I think it almost is the right word. Yeah, there is this <coughs> sort of like that's the only way it seems that you can, you know, people who have different experiences or share some experiences but have parts of their life that are quite different. That's the yeah. 
normal society sort of seems to want to normalise them is to make is to picture them at this sort of extreme edge, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and I mean something I should have said earlier is that when, when I was talking about uh, the idea of the white male professional, in some ways, I, I'm kind of part of that. Um, I, I wasn't, haven't always been though, and it might not be a lifelong thing. We don't know. Um, you know, when I was uh, working in kitchens, that was just so, so, so painful. But, yeah, any... Uh, else? Hello. Uh, uh, sort of similar celebrity idea. I, a decade or so ago, um, was in a lecture where a woman was talking about autism, and yeah. she was saying to us, at the Yale University, and she said, here's the, here's the continuum. Right. And she said, the majority of us in the room are probably about here, and the majority of the professors at the university are probably about here. Yeah. High, high end. Yeah. And the, the suggestion was that we, as a university, attract, or would like to attract more people who have different ways of thinking Yeah. as researchers, because it brings up the... Do you find that that is the case in higher education now? You've clearly gone through the process. You've um, supposedly been supported to get. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is, uh, is it is it more positive now? Than it is? Uh, I, th I think that there is a problem with the humanities in this area, mm -hmm. um, because uh, the way that the Cambridge Research Centre frames this, um, it's like. Uh, the, this, this idea of a predisposition to being good at maths and there is a serious risk of streamlining there. I mean, the curious incident of the dog where that's such a part of the novel, that is used on teacher training courses, uh, sometimes very often as the only text on the module to represent uh, disability, um, a young adult novel. The, there was one, I mean this isn't typical of academics, I hope, but um, there was one university lecturer who, who, who wrote the journal article about how she read, sorry, he read The Curious Incident of the Dog and thought, oh, that, that student reminds me of this, and decided to turn this whole thing into a journal article. He, um, so, so the tutor actually phoned up this student's school and said, you know, I've got, I've got this idea about Gregory. Uh, do you think he might be on the Asperger spectrum? And, and, and he, was, he was able to publish this. Um, that, that is an extreme example. But this thing of um, how fiction can so influence um, fact or what is taken as fact is, is a problem. Um, I think there might also be something to say here about how the science, the STEM subjects dominate university funding more broadly. I mean, Ruth might know more about that than, than me. I think that there is more support than there used to be. I think it would be really important to have, have, have more support. I mean, when, um, it's another event for Disability History Month, I was, was talking about this, but um, when I've tried to find out, you know, there must be quite a lot of people in my situation, which, you know, your, what, what you reported suggests. Um, when, when, you, um, when you Google uh, autistic lecturers or Asperger's and lecturers, the first hundred or so things that will come up are advice for lecturers in working with students with those diagnoses. That's really important and, and there should be uh, more of that. But what, what isn't really recognised is that uh, students with these conditions can, can become lecturers, um, uh, th which in some ways is partly connected with the youth thing, you know, the child being the dominant. <laughs> Yeah. Susan. Um, you mentioned the book by Claire Morrill, is it? Claire, yeah. Um, uh, what other good portrayals, or, or interesting, or innovative? Okay. And are they novels, poems? What's the range? Okay. Um, po poems, I would say, uh, Les Murray, Australian poet. Um, I, I know you, you know an expert on, on this. Uh, Les Murray, Australian poet. Uh, if you look at the poem Portrait in Line Scan, um, another very interesting novel about this uh, is Meg Valitza, which is so Meg W O L I T Z E R. 
and the novel is called The Interestings. Um, Robert Williams, uh, a young adult novel called Luke and John, and then, uh, not, not a sequel or anything, but another novel by Robert Williams is called Into the Trees. Uh, what, what you get in, in Williams' work is a, more of the kind of intersectionality, more to do with class, actually, than, than gender. Um, another poet, uh, Joanne Lindbergh, whose book, The Autistic Alice, is coming out in, I think, April next year. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to, to read that and, and to, to write about it in the book. Yes, Kelly. Like, if there's any maybe good TV programs or documentaries or films or anything, just I'm not a very big reader. For one. Okay. <laughs> uh, what actually started this whole book off, uh, and it's, such, it's become such a massive thing that I'm just going to have to wait until I get a chance to write something else. But the film, and which is based on a short novel, which I just think, I just adore it, is being there. The film with Peter Sellers uh, from 1979. I saw that film and I was so moved by it. What you have is basically an adult with undiagnosed autism and the situations he goes through. It's often very funny, but not in a way that trivialises it. And one thing it really brings out is uh, the subjectivity of people's expectations. So if you just Google being there, Peter Sellers, it's based on a novel by Jersey Kaczynski. Yeah, Lindsay. What I was going to ask was, um, do you think there needs to be more literary interpret interpretations of females on the spectrum because you don't get enough of that because Definitely. women and girls tend to hide yeah. and mask their traits, so to speak, and that in comparison. I think. I think that altogether in literature, in culture, and in science, most of all, there should be more attention, more serious thought. It's a to the given, as well. Yeah. There's research going on with the National Autistic Society as well. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Um, it, it is, uh, the, yeah, the gender imbalance is. Um, it's very sort of un unreliable, I think, but um, yeah, th there altogether needs to be far, far, far more recognition of girls and women who, um, who have diagnosis or might want to seek assessment. It is a serious problem, and I know I keep going on about it, but the Cambridge Autism Research Centre, they are really fixated on the idea that they actually use the phrase, you know, the, the, ex the equator autism with so-called the extreme male brain. Yeah. But if you look at some of Baron Cohen's writing, you know, uh, there's one part in his book from 2003 where he writes a list of these are things that the male brain is naturally good at. And there's nine things. Then he writes a list of what the female brain is naturally good at. There are five things. One of those things is gossip. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is from 2003, republished 2012 with no alterations. So, um, but you know, m m maybe there can be change in culture mm. that will lead to change in it's science. Really think about that because, like, I've never seen, or oh, rarely seen, a literary interpretation of a female with, on the spectrum. Yeah. I think that if there was to be, Yes, and that, that's why I would recommend Claire Morrell's book, The Language of Others, uh, for starting point. Yeah, Ruth. And I, I, I'm really fascinated by everything you said, and I think, um, yet again, this is a really brave and really wonderful presentation, so thank you mm. so much for that. But I'd also like to ask, in a in sense, a question that is a little bit personal. Overall... I might not answer it, but okay. car no, no, carry on. Oh, I don't, I don't mind uh, answering that. Um, <laughs> better. Because um, things like reasonable adjustments at work. Definitely. Yeah. Um, the sense that, uh, having been told about this sort of, sometimes in quite cruel ways by people in other very different 
workplaces and things. Um, you know, when, once when I was working in a certain bookshop and uh, someone just said to me, uh, working with you, James, is like working with uh, a kid with learning disabilities. And it was, it was kind of meant as a joke, but I, di I didn't hear it that way. Uh, and then a few weeks later, he saw me looking at a book on Asperger's syndrome. And he said, oh, for God's sake, you're not now thinking you're autistic, are you? And it's this thing of, no, we will decide what you are. Now, a psychiatric diagnosis is in a way a variant on that, but it gives you a sense that, okay, there are reasons that might be beyond my control why I, uh, I struggle with certain things. So I, I most definitely do not regret having the diagnosis but nor do I regret waiting for quite a while. Edmund, hello. Um, I was just wondering, um, some of the examples you showed came from the United States. Yeah. Uh, okay, which is are there different uh, national cultural interpretations of it, given it's probably about how people behave? Um, experience having been to America, they tend to be much more touchy anyway. Right. Which I find quite difficult. Yeah, that, that, uh, all, all sorts of cultural differences could come into this. I mean, um, for example, in, w w one American psychiatrist writing about this, um, she said uh, about how she was first greeted by, um, I think, a seven year old child who greeted her by uh, holding his hand up for her to shake and uh, saying, um, How do you do, Dr. Wilson? Um, and she thought that was really strange. But it just so happened that in the same month I was reading a book about class in Britain and um, there's an excellent piece that Max Farah just wrote in an interview about how as a child growing up in quite an upper middle class family he was taught as a four year old to offer your hand and say how do you do sir? That was a class thing, not... A, so, so there are so many things, nationality, gender, age and then there's also the fact that autism like like any identity in sex with, intersects with other disabilities, other illnesses, you know. Um, one more author you should look up, Peter Street. Yeah. Have you seen the, um, I'm just thinking, coming back to Lindsay's point about female, trials of females, there's a current, um, the Swedish species at the moment, Modus. Yeah. Which has got a girl in it, a teenage girl who's autistic, who's witnessed, it just started last week, witnessed a murder. Yes, uh, Rachel, I, I, I will definitely be seeking that out, yeah, yeah. But not before you finish the book. Not before I finish the book, no. <laughs> Hello. There's a not very, I think, good film out at the moment called The... It's not The Accountant, the Accountant. is it? And it, to me, the take-home message is that all autistic men are very dangerous and want to kill everybody. Yeah. Uh, no, I... I thought, I was... I, I mean, I hate... I hate. The, the, there is a brilliant review of this by uh, Rebecca... Uh, if you email me, I, I can forward it to you. But, uh, yeah, The Accountant... Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I was thinking, sh sh should I go and see this or not? And I read an interview with the director where he said, uh, yeah, to research this, I, uh, I, I spent time with, uh, with autistic people. That's something you get a lot from directors, authors. There's something deeply patronising about it. I mean, they might, they might genuinely be seeing that as a good thing, but there's something exploitative about it. And what they end up with is a composite. You know, they take bits and pieces, a bit like a kind of Frankenstein's monster effect. All the most sensational elements combined into one person. Uh, to be fair, you could liken that to what happens in a lot of psychiatric textbooks. Um, but yeah, the accountant, I just thought, no. I wish I had <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well, perhaps we should thank James, because we haven't yet. So. Okay, thank, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming.